When it comes to failed inventions, bad ideas run the gamut. But in all likelihood, no other single invention has spawned more failed spin-offs than the automobile. Individual tinkerers and major car manufacturers alike have always tried to come up with new and exciting ways to get a car to take us where we want to go. The uh, 1950s were a period of uh, growing prosperity in the United States. You had uh, a lot of confidence in modernity and the future, and this was a really kind of car crazy time when uh, a lot of people's fantasies were invested in their automobiles and a lot of uh, manufacturers tried to satisfy that that wish fulfillment and that's I think why we saw some of these rather bizarre concepts come along in the 1960s the Ford Motor Company was eager to show the public it was on the cutting edge of innovative design and actually toyed with the notion of building a nuclear powered engine the Nucleon, as it was called, would have come complete with its own plutonium pod. But questions of where to refuel and the potential dangers of having a rolling nuclear reactor kept the Nucleon from making it past this three-foot model stage. A more serious experiment began in 1954, when the Chrysler Corporation embarked on a nearly 30-year odyssey to create a car whose power plant would borrow jet age technology to improve power and efficiency. A car with the power plant of a jet engine. October 1963 saw the arrival of Chrysler's new turbine powered car. Engines built by American engineers were sheathed in a European styled body, co-designed with the Ghia Corporation's top Italian designers. With 80% fewer parts than the standard car engine, Chrysler was also promoting the turbine's simple design and reliability. Here is full power potential for instant acceleration and outstanding climbing ability. The driver is assured the same control he can get in the best conventional passenger car, even on the steepest grades. The car's engine was surprisingly simple in design. Air would be drawn into the Chrysler's compressor where temperature and air pressure would be dramatically increased. The air would then be forced into a burner where it would mix with fuel creating combustion. Heated gases would then expand through a series of turbine wheels to transform thermal energy into mechanical energy to turn the car's wheels. Power and handling for the Chrysler turbine was equal to anything else on the road. However, Acceleration was sluggish due to the turbine's lag in engaging the transmission. But the Chrysler turbine did have one fascinating feature. It ran on any combustible liquid, gasoline, perfume, or even corn oil. All worked equally well. There's an anecdotal story that the proving grounds, they had poured scotch into the tank to see if they could make it run that way. And when they were done running it, a couple of salty old mechanics in the garage were very unhappy that they wasted scotch in such a manner. The project was ultimately deemed unfeasible largely because production costs would have been too high for consumers. Research in new metal alloys able to withstand the turbine's high operating temperatures was also lagging. 50 cars were built by Ghia of Italy uh, in Turin. They sent these to the United States for evaluation. Uh, they were all fitted with the motor here in the United States. After seven years when the program was done, due to tax and customs reasons, all but nine of the vehicles were destroyed. Chrysler finally abandoned the turbine engine concept in 1981. But surely the most unusual failed car design was the product of a German amphibious aircraft designer, Hans Trippler. The Amphibious car came out in the mid-60s when the Bond movies were big, and the notion that you could just head into the water to escape pursuit had a kind of escapist appeal. <laughs> For nine years, beginning in 1960, Tripler exported nearly 3,000 of his Amphicars to the U.S. Each Amphicar came with a standard four-cylinder engine and its own bilge pump. A false bottom floor protects electrical wiring and gives added protection from leaks. A dash-mounted switch engages the transmission-powered dual propellers. The Amphi car handles primarily like a car in the water, but consequently it handles pretty much like a boat on land. The uh, twin propellers in the rear 
turn them in the same direction, only one way can you turn pretty efficiently. The other way turns kind of like the Queen Mary. Costing nearly the same amount as a Mustang, the public faced a tough choice. Cool muscle car or ugly duckling that was all wet. The Mustang won the popularity contest. The legacy will be a great idea that never was popularized enough and so never took off. But the biggest flops in the auto industry have come at the hands of giant-sized personalities chasing their dream of building the perfect car. A former Ford designer, Preston Tucker, was one of those dreamers. His plan was grand, some said foolhardy, to build a car company from the ground up. Preston Tucker was, above all, a salesman. And like all salesmen, the first thing he sold was himself. And he was a man with lots of ideas. He was always promoting these ideas. After the war, when the market was exploding, he thought that he could build an automobile. Starting an automobile company from scratch in 1948 was actually a virtually impossible task because the capital required was so huge that nobody could come up with it. Tucker's vision for his four-wheeled namesake was to build the safest car on the road. He designed this car, a rear-engine car. He put a lot of emphasis on safety, making a crush-proof passenger compartment and a pop-out windshield. And the idea was that in an accident, when you went forward into the windshield, the windshield would pop out, and you wouldn't cut yourself. The Tucker's most memorable feature was the Triclops, a third headlight that turned with the steering wheel to continuously light the road ahead. Long before a single car was produced, the savvy Tucker was conjuring ways to generate buzz for his dream car. One of the ways to promote the car was to build the radio for the car. And you could go in and you could buy the radio for your Tucker. And to make sure that you were always aware that that was a radio for your Tucker, why the buttons, the push buttons on the radio had the letters T-U-C-K-E-R on, on one on each button. But when Tucker began selling stock in his fledgling enterprise, his dream began to evaporate. Once word spread that the government was investigating Tucker's business practices, investors' money quickly dried up. It's safe to say that more shares in Tucker's company were sold than actual Tucker automobiles. In all, only 50 cars were ever built. Another man who shared a passion for elevating the automobile's design was Edsel Ford, Henry's son. Killed during World War II, the Ford company wanted to honor him by attaching his name to their newest project. Up to now, we at Ford have called it simply the E-Car. Today, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to announce its official name, Edsel, in honor of my father, who served as president of Ford Motor Company. The Edsel has, of course, gone down in history as, as a synonym for failure. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate, first of all, because the Edsel, with its rather odd name, is actually named after Henry Ford's only son. Some people think it was ugly. Other people just think it looked funny. The irony is that Edsel Ford, after whom the car is named, was a man of impeccable taste, and he was the inspiration for what is regarded as one of the most beautiful cars of all time, the original Mark I Lincoln Continental. Among the things that the Edsel was uh, immediately ridiculed for was its distinctive, what they called the horse collar grill, but which became more commonly known as the toilet seat grill. <laughs> Only three years after its debut, Ford pulled the Edsel from its lineup. Estimates place Ford's cost for marketing and building the Edsel at somewhere between $250 to $350 million, the industry's biggest flop. There's no telling what new inventions will come rolling down the highway in the coming years, but perhaps the future of automotive transportation lies in the skies above. Next, cars that fly and men that soar without wings. The Wright brothers built the world's first successful airplane, 
here at their bike shop in December of 1903. And since that fateful day, there has been no shortage of failed attempts to invent a different, if not better, kind of flying machine. Keep your eye on the birdie. Cuckoo, cuckoo. By mid-century, America's love affair with the car was in full bloom. And marrying the airplane and automobile seemed a perfect tonic for quickly and easily moving a world of adventurous souls. I think there's just uh, something in the crackpot inventor that loves the idea of marrying two things that don't really go together. There are uh, a number of uh, flying car uh, attempts over the years. Recently, someone tried to make a flying Pinto, which uh, with its history of uh, fuel tank explosions would seem to be uh, doubly alarming. More than 75 patents for flying cars have been issued since 1917, but only one, Moult Taylor's 1949 Aero Car, attained any lasting notoriety. Moulton Taylor was inspired to build an Aero Car because he believed that in the period after World War II, there were lots of pilots and we had very congested highways. Very possibly, he could develop a flying car that would alleviate some of that ground congestion in the form of a flying car. With the, uh, the flying car, you had necessary compromises. The car itself was not particularly roadworthy. It wasn't heavy enough to be safe on the road. When you just put wings on this thing, you have a rather clunky airplane. The notion that just ordinary drivers would be flying around, particularly over uh, major cities, is uh, alarming in itself. The same guys that cut you off on the highway at 65 miles an hour would instead be cutting you off at uh, 10,000 feet. Still, the aero car had some unique features. It was the first U.S. rear-engine car with a front-wheel drive. An aft-mounted drive shaft powered the pusher prop, while the rear wheels were allowed to freely spin, a critical feature for smooth landings. An earlier version of a flying car, Robert Fulton's 1946 Air Fibian, had a single cumbersome fuselage and wing component that necessitated stowage at local airports. Unfortunately, it's an invention whose time has not yet come, and it never really gets off the ground. Moult Taylor's aero car, on the other hand, strove to keep travel flexible with its foldable and towable wings. Flying into a storm, find a runway, land, tow your wings to clearer skies, and resume your airborne journey. While its lines aren't particularly aerodynamic, the aero car required only a standard small craft runway. Still, red tape kept the aero car mostly grounded. The market is too small to build a flying car where you have to be a pilot, a driver, you have to have an FAA medical, you have to have all the other licenses to operate radios and things like that. A high price tag and the inconvenience of attaching and reattaching wings also helped kill the dream of flying cars for the masses. Only five aero cars were ever built, leaving us with only the fantasy of flying out of a rush hour jam. Man being powered through the air without benefit of plane or balloon is today a reality. Tomorrow, he may even be a traffic problem. For many, the 1960s rocket belt remains the most intriguing flying invention that failed. There were several incarnations over the years. The first was built by the Bell Jet Labs. The original intent of the hydrogen-powered rocket belt was to provide soldiers with a means for aerial reconnaissance, ease of travel over difficult terrain, and a stable weapons firing platform. The rocket belt failed on all counts. It was too loud to provide safe spying held only enough fuel for 21-second trips, and was too complex to fly and fire weapons at the same time. The most famous version was designed and built by famed Hollywood cameraman Nelson Tyler, whose rocket belt flew over the 1984 Olympics. Uh, the whole thing is controlled with uh, these arms that come out. You've got a throttle to go up and down, move the stick up and down, you fly forward and aft, sideways, you twist this. It's a fun thing. It's pretty hard to fly. It's hard to learn and train because you only have 20 seconds at a time to do it. If the rocket belt fails, you just fall like a brick, except you fall with this thing on your back and all this fuel so that when you crash, you burn, you know. 
The rocket belt is powered by a specially formulated 90% pure hydrogen peroxide mix. Forced under pressure through a series of fine silver meshes, a chemical reaction is produced that creates heat, water, and 300 pounds of steam-powered thrust. The military abandoned the rocket belt in the 1960s, unable to develop lighter fuels for longer flight times. But the sight of this strange contraption has made imagination soar with the possibility of Superman-like wingless flight. Of all the items in our stock catalog, there is only one which would have the high velocity and low wind resistance of flying saucers. The cover of a GI trash can. For years, people have sworn that flying saucers have appeared around Nevada's infamous Area 51, home of several supposed UFO sightings. There might be some truth to those rumors. Meet the Avro, a two-seater flying disc built in 1958 by the U.S. Air Force and Canadian manufacturers. Trying to capitalize on emerging jet technology, the U.S. military spent nearly $12 million on the futuristic Avro. Intended to hover at altitudes greater than 10,000 feet, the three turbine fans generated enough lift for a pilot and his passenger. The 927 pounds of thrust from the Continental Turbo Power Plants was directed downward via internal shafts to create a hovercraft effect. The Avro was also equipped with a special side-mounting venting system to provide additional lateral control to prevent tipping. Engineers were never able to completely control the unwieldy Avro during untethered flights or get it to lift more than several inches off the ground. Barely able to cross small ditches, the Air Force's hope for an all-terrain vehicle was dashed. Hovering discs, flying cars, and flying rocket men have all but disappeared from the scene. But some of the biggest flops have come at the hands of those with the most success. Up next, Thomas Edison gets bogged down in houses made of cement. Most failed inventions are the brainchilds of anonymous creators. But they're in good company. Even great minds have bad ideas. Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, and futurist Buckminster Fuller have all laid eggs during their otherwise successful careers. Anyone who's really thinking out of the box, who is pushing themselves constantly, is going to uh, kick out a few ideas that just simply don't work. Nikola Tesla is remembered as the champion of electricity's alternating current, the X-ray, and wireless communication. He created the power station at Niagara Falls, and in an era of the horse and buggy, Tesla was creating radio-guided torpedoes. But many wonder if some of his inventions came from an even darker place. Tesla would have to be considered one of the quintessential mad scientists of all time. Tesla was said to have been engaged in designing a death ray for the US government just prior to World War I. Generating more than 50 million volts of electricity, the super-concentrated beam of energy would theoretically have been powerful enough to destroy entire cities. The idea seemed outlandish, but with Tesla, you never knew. He was the kind of guy that you didn't want to uh, dismiss too lightly because he had achieved enough of his, uh, of his theories that uh, he had quite a, quite a bit of credibility. Tesla also imagined a day in which airplanes would be powered not by engines, but by powerful electromagnetic beams of energy. Broadcast from towers across the United States, airplanes would be pushed along their journey via small belly-mounted receptors. Tesla went so far as to build a giant 175-foot electrical tower on Long Island. But funding fell through before tests could be conducted. Although he conquered Niagara Falls, Tesla's genius didn't extend to his personal finances. He died nearly penniless, unable to test the countless ideas he scribbled in his notebooks each day. Researchers still scour his writings, hoping to uncover some new kernel of genius. Even the great inventive mind of Thomas Edison hatched some duds. The father of the light bulb, phonograph, and motion picture, Edison was granted an astounding 400 patents in a prolific eight-year period from 1879 to 1886. But after the age of 40, things began to go sour for the Wizard of Menlo Park. 
Thomas Edison comes to Menlo Park in 1876 at the age of about 29. At this point, he is really soaring as an inventor, creative, innovative. Everything he touches is, is incredible. You might say from about the age of 25 to about 40, he has this, what you might call, Midas touch. And it's not gold, it's platinum. And yet, there's a demarcation line. Right after that, all of a sudden, things that he touches aren't quite as successful, and it seems to get worse as time gets on. Kind of turns toward uh, plate aluminum, you might say, in, in the later years. One of Edison's more bizarre failures involved manipulating electricity's powers to create a device for communicating with the dead. After the carnage of World War I, Edison felt families might be interested in contacting lost loved ones. Among his theories was the belief in an invisible source of electrical energy that could actually link survivors with people who had died. To date, no one has answered any of Edison's calls. Another Edison invention that failed was the talking doll, an idea that turned out to be way ahead of the day's technology. Edison invented the phonograph in 1877. In 1889, he decided to make a talking doll. He imported the heads from Germany because they had the best bisque heads. On the dolls, he had a little phonograph motor, which was hand-driven, and a little wax record that would be placed around. There was a total of about seven or eight different songs that you can buy. It would be placed inside the chest of this doll and be closed. And the children would crank the doll, but it was very difficult at the time to, to work this phonograph. First of all, you had to keep it at a constant speed, and you had to take the whole motor apart just to put a new record in. But the doll had two fatal flaws. The phonograph was too delicate for child's play. And the wax recordings wore out after only a few plays, leaving the metal stylus to grate against the steel cylinder. The result gave the doll a horrible screech that sent its tiny owners running. Edison folded the company in 1891. Another Edison idea that never got off, or in this case, on the ground, was his design for a mass-producible house made entirely of concrete. The idea was not unrelated to the fact that Edison owned the Portland Cement Company, a major American supplier of concrete. Cement was very, very profitable to Thomas Edison. Yankee Stadium was made of Edison cement. The Panama Canal was made of Edison cement. So Edison was doing very well with cement, very profitable, a wonderful industry, and he started coming up with ideas what to do with, with cement. Edison stood to make a fortune if he could get Americans to fall in love with the idea of a concrete home. And to that end, he commissioned expensive and heavy cast iron molds of every part of a two-story, 1,500-square-foot house. All that would be needed to finish was plumbing and wiring. Edison even created an ill-fated line of concrete furniture for his homes, including couches and chairs. As soon as the press heard about it, they had cartoons with a two-horse team connected to your couch every time you wanted the dust. And Edison actually liked the cartoon. He hung it up in his office. In a day when the average house sold for a few thousand dollars, the concrete house carried a heavy price tag of over a hundred thousand dollars. Mass production would be the only way to keep the homes affordable. Edison's cement works produced only 11 homes before going bankrupt. Edison wasn't the only well-known inventor to come up with an original and ill-fated idea for mass housing. Buckminster Fuller was a highly regarded engineer and veteran futurist. Michigan's Henry Ford Museum contains the only existing Fuller-designed Dymaxion house. Fuller's failed dream of lighter, cheaper housing is being reconstructed for public display. After World War II, there was everybody and his brother trying to get in and make a buck off the housing shortage. But Fuller had a totally different idea uh, to revolutionize the housing industry, both factory production and a completely new engineering concept, the Damaxian house, which stood for dynamic maximum tension. Unlike most homes, which sit on a foundation, Fuller felt that certain materials performed better in tension. The entire house is suspended by wires hung from a central mast, much like an umbrella. Nothing rests on the ground. Fuller turned to an aircraft manufacturing firm to produce a lightweight and easy-to-ship aluminum exterior. 
the entire home could be delivered in a single tube. The cost of a new Dymaxion house was $6,500. The two bedrooms each had their own tiny prefab bathroom cubes. Uh, it's not what we think of as a bathroom today. It's a little bit close in there, folks. As well as imaginative revolving shelving units to maximize the restricted space. Like Fuller's later geodesic dome home, the Dymaxion failed in part because it was so different. Its one-size-fits-all floor plan made add-ons impossible for growing families. The house's round shape also gave homeowners headaches, trying to make square bookcases and couches fit into their new, round world. Like many others, Fuller's Dymaxion house may have also failed because he was just a bit ahead of his time. While some failed inventions tried making life easier, others came close to destroying it. Up next, a jaw-dropping glass of water. The field of medicine has produced the lion's share of failed inventions, and Bob McCoy has amassed a collection of more than 250,000 bizarre gadgets at his Minneapolis-based Museum of Questionable Medical Devices. The discovery in 1898 of the radioactive element of radium spawned dozens of lethal medical inventions. People wonder why there are so many radium inventions. I think it's because it was a popular thing in the beginning of the 20th century. It had a certain sense of vitality and energy. Not only did they sell radium products thinking they're gonna make you healthy, they also tied it in with sexuality. They were making radioactive athletic supporters for weak, sagging men. They were drying out boar's testicles and making them radioactive to improve your romantic talent. Uh, they were making radium suppositories for men or women. A whole line of goofy stuff like this were being sold. Fast talkers attributed all manner of benefits to this hot fad. This was called the Cosmos Radioactive Pad, marketed to people who had arthritis with a promise that it relieved the pain of arthritis. Oddly enough, on the back it says, warning, do not open this and eat the contents of this bag. Who would want to eat a bag of radium? In the beginning of the 20th century, radium was big business. It was imported, for the most part, from Europe. Here is a grocery store selling radioactive water, claiming you have the invisible hand of Mother Nature in your body to make you healthy. All of this was going fine until a fellow in Pittsburgh began marketing these little bottles of Radithor to improve your romantic talent. A man in Pittsburgh drank 1,400 bottles of this. His upper and lower jaw fell off. That's when they realized this radium cannot be sold willy-nilly, that it was dangerous. Like radium, the invention of the X-ray also spawned a host of potentially lethal creations. The X-ray is discovered in 1896 and put into use almost immediately, and it seems miraculous to people. But then, as often happens with these technologies, they get a little warped, and people begin loading on more expectations on top of them. Things snowball and go skidding off the road and become ludicrous at best and sometimes lethal at worst. Case in point, in the 1940s and 50s, shoe stores all over the country and the U.S. military were using the Adrian X-ray shoe fitting machines to achieve exact sizings. The appeal was to see your own toes wiggling in your shoes and seeing, oh, those are my toes, and to see if your shoes were too narrow or too short or too wide or too near or long. The uh, company in Milwaukee produced about 10,000 of these things. And uh, even though they were lead lined, there was no lead shielding around either the ports into which you put your feet or the various viewing ports. It had three of them, one for the customer, one for the shoe salesman, and one for parents in case they were buying shoes for their child. The amount of x-ray leakage is rather alarming. As a comic book enthusiast, I'm rather perplexed why we didn't have super-powered shoe salesmen as a result of uh, all the rampant ra radiation bombarding these uh, fellows that worked in the stores. Once radiation leakage was confirmed in 1950, the government ordered the machines destroyed. The arrival of electricity in homes generated a slew of new medical appliances, none of them with more dubious value than the prostate gland warmer. It was patented in 1918. It's supposed to excite a man's abdominal brain. 
Did you know men had abdominal brains? The U.S. Patent Office says we do. Now, the wattage of this bulb controls how warm this will be. This is a 25-watt bulb, and this doesn't get too hot. Actually, this didn't do anything. Electronic medical gadgets weren't the only inventions that failed because they didn't live up to expectations. Nearly 50 years later, inventors had shifted their focus from medicine to gadgets we find every day around our houses. At a 1977 Polaroid stockholders meeting, President Edwin Land, the inventor of the Polaroid instant camera, proudly unveiled his latest creation, Polavision. Dubbed a movie in a minute, Land said Polavision's home movies would become a part of your diary. Utilizing a Polaroid-like developing system, Polavision used short two-minute recording cartridges. Each cartridge cost $10 and needed a special TV set to develop the Polaroid movie film. Polavision did not record sound. As Land addressed his stockholders, he wasn't banking on the success of the new Sony Betamax and JVC VHS video formats. Consumers opted for the longer recording times, sound, and instantaneous playback of video. Polaroid lost over $65 million in research and marketing costs. While video systems rendered Polavision useless, the society of unuseless inventions welcomes the near misses. An unuseless invention is something that is useless in the sense that it doesn't work. It's not the sort of invention that will make your life necessarily easier, but it's not entirely useless. It's almost useful or it's unuseless because it gives amusement to people. Uh, this is the honest husband hat, and the idea is that a lady can give this to her husband or her boyfriend and assure that when he walks through the park, he's not going to look at all the pretty girls because he's got a picture of the wife and kids right here to remind him of his uh, romantic obligations. This is the AC-free battery charger, and the notion is that you can uh, recharge one of your old batteries simply by using 12 new batteries. It does really work, but you'll also shorten the lives of these 12 new batteries, so what you need is another 144 batteries in order to pump these back up. This is the Back Scratchers t-shirt. If you've ever had that problem of having to tell your partner higher, lower to the left or the right, you, you know F3? that uh, it would be so much more convenient if you could just say, please scratch F3. Oh, oh yeah, oh, good, good. The unuseless inventions are a way of celebrating the fact that failure is just as important as success to the development of future technology. And today, uh, with all the technology we have in the 21st century, we're standing as much on the back of past failure as we are past success. Plenty of failed inventions have affected the useful and necessary items that touch our everyday lives. Next, failed visions of lifestyles of the future. Most failed inventions have to do with the everyday things in our lives. The food that we eat, the clothes that we wear, the gadgets we have lying around the house, and even as Buckminster Fuller discovered, our homes themselves. Ann Arbor, Michigan's new Product Works Research Center certainly looks like a supermarket, but it isn't. In fact, this is a place where failed products come to die. To date, more than 80,000 of them have come here as their final resting place. Every year, more than 30,000 new products hit the shelves, and every year, more than 90% of them fail. An expensive proposition considering supermarket products like these can cost up to 20 to 50 million dollars to launch. Robert McMath created this space in 1981 to help manufacturers launch new products. One of the things the uh, collection represents is uh, learning uh, lessons from the past, uh, and there are very positive lessons uh, to learn from uh, mistakes as well as the successes. We like to say we, we offer success insurance. Bad packaging, bad names, and just plain bad ideas can all add up to be concept killers. 
This is an interesting product. This is Barbecue Buddies. This was a nice uh, barbecue sauce you sprayed on, and I always thought this was a great idea. The unfortunate problem is the package is so tall on its uh, own before you even put the sprayer on that it doesn't fit on the average shelf. You can't put it on a supermarket shelf. You have to put it up at the top. It also doesn't fit in the refrigerator. Avert is a great concept, but unfortunately, uh, they refer to it as a virucidal tissue, and that kind of got people scared. Uh, they think of homicidal and whatever else, and they weren't quite sure what a virucidal tissue was. This was an interesting product. It is actually a scrambled egg type of product uh, on a stick, and you can push it up. So it's a very convenient product uh, for taking with you, uh, perhaps in the car. The unfortunate problem is that it fell apart if you pushed it up wrong and people were complaining in the cars that the eggs were falling in their lap. In the 1980s, a nationwide health craze spawned a number of clean products that hit the supermarket aisles. It also saw one of the biggest supermarket product failures of all time. The notion was a smokeless cigarette that wouldn't involve uh, uh, burning tobacco, but rather a uh, element that would produce the flavor of uh, tobacco in your mouth through a plastic tube. The device was uh, extremely difficult to light. Then sucking on this thing, they said, was uh, enough to promote a hernia. The taste of it was compared to burning lettuce. Even the president of uh, R.J. Reynolds uh, admitted that the uh, premiere tasted like crap. For many outsiders, the arrival of the Premier seemed like a kind of admission from Reynolds' executives. And the cigarette companies did not want to acknowledge that there were any health dangers of cigarettes themselves. What they hit upon was to describe it as a clean smoking experience. But at the same time, they didn't want to acknowledge that uh, their other brands were dirty or unclean. With no smoke to blow or ashes to flick, the Premier's cigarette robbed smokers of much of the smoking ritual. Consumer disinterest quickly extinguished the idea, costing Reynolds more than $300 million in research and marketing costs. Failed inventions haven't just affected the food we eat. They've touched every part of our daily lives, right down to the clothes on our backs. There have been clothes made from lava. Volcanic eruptions may one day become the source of a whole line of earthy fashions. And even a slew of fresh styles straight from the farm. Would you believe this transparent raincoat made in 1955 came from surplus fat from pork chops? But the paper dress ripped the competition. The paper dress is one of those almost uniquely 60s phenomena. It speaks a lot about the uh, kind of carefree, go-go days. The Scott Paper Company manufactured the first dresses to promote a new line of napkins and towels. The stains could simply be erased or trimmed away. Ultimately, the paper dress lost favor because its one-size-fits-all soured women who didn't appreciate its billowy, moo-moo-style cut. But where to put all those paper dresses and grocery store flops? Creating a vision of tomorrow and the homes we'll live in has proved to be an uphill battle that most inventors never quite get right. Towering buildings and bright lights of the city of tomorrow where plazas of urban living rise over freeways and vehicles electronically paced, travel routes safely, swiftly, efficiently. Any kind of projection of the future is a statement about present realities. Uh, the city of tomorrow will be clean and spacious. Well, that's because the city of today is, in other words, they're saying is crowded and awful and uh, depressing. Inventors have long claimed the house of the future will come with a robot or two that frees man from the workaday grind. The future will be full of free time. I can perform 36 separate and distinct acts. Anyone out there knows of a mechanical woman who is looking for a boyfriend. The, the robot is a powerful symbol of uh, the world of tomorrow. We're still waiting around, most of us. I don't know if you've got one, but I think we're still waiting around for our own personal robots to hang around our house and service our coffee in the morning and take the dog for a walk. All of those things were supposed to have been here by now, um, and, and they're not. Inventors predicted time-saving gadgets would create unprecedented leisure time. 
In fact, downtime has decreased despite the advance of technology. This will be washed, even egg stains removed by washers that require no cleansing agent. High frequency sound waves dissolve food particles and dirt. Inventors always claim that their devices are going to save you something. It's going to save you labor, going to save you time, going to save you drudgery. But because you can do it more often, you do do it more often, and so you don't end up saving time. And so even successful inventions can be regarded as failures because they really haven't saved you anything. Major corporations oftentimes used the house of the future as a draw as they became containers of magical devices. Come see the home of tomorrow. Well, we're often drawn to it as a kind of a spectacular piece of entertainment, but nobody really wants to live in something that looks like that. People just wanted something that looked like everybody else's. I think even when their inventions don't really happen, they've always provided us with something to think about. I think when we look at a lot of uh, failed inventions or innovations that went nowhere, we are tempted to see it as a history of failure. but. That's not really what it is at all. In fact, these are kind of testimonies to the human spirit. Without the courage to fail, without the courage to try something that may or may not work, we'd never enjoy the progress that we have. We should look at people who are great minds, great thinkers. Look at what they did. Uh, they're discovering new things. Yes, there were mistakes. Yes, there were some real bad ideas. But a lot of these bad ideas led to the formulation of good ideas by other great inventors and maybe even the future, who knows? No matter that these ideas fell short of their intended goal, the world has a special place in its collective heart for forward thinkers, tinkerers, and daydreamers who march to the beat of their own drum. Necessity might have mothered a notion that only its inventor could love, but the creative spark, no matter how dim, deserves even the occasional nod of recognition.